my pleasure to have Adrian, which has, a, again, another impressive background, but he's just Adrian, a guy who wants to tell us a few things that he's working now on. Now you could wonder how this guy learned all these things. Well, check. Well, he has been working before SGI. No, it's like Sun. Sun. Okay. So we all have history, but his history is interesting in other companies that you maybe heard about it. Check the bio. Thank you. Well, okay. Well, thank you. And uh, I, I, I was inspired by uh, Rob yesterday, who told, spoke a little bit about the Maori welcome. So I, I'm, I figured out a version of a Maori welcome. So I'll get to that in a sec. But um, I particularly, I'm, I'm sort of retired, kind of retired, do what I feel like, don't no longer work for a big company. But so I do, I practice what I call conference driven development. Where it's just like, there's a conference over there. That looks nice. Let's figure out to go to that one. That means I need to, put a, I need to do enough work to figure out an abstract. I could get that in. And then it's like I have a deadline approaching. And that's really the only deadlines I have in my life now. Um, and I particularly like single track community building conferences. And th th like this, there's several that I go to that are like this. And you just keep going year after year and you build the community. And and it's a really, it's really my favorite kind of conference. So. I'm very happy it's my first time here. And the thing that surprised me was just how much Maori culture and local culture um, is in this and the people attending and the discussions and you know, all of that. So I, I found that it was une unexpected. I mean, I've seen a little bit of it in, in, in some of the discussions, but um, I found that uh, I found that particularly inspiring. Um, I've also, so Mark Bregman was here for the first day and a half of the conference. He runs a, a venture capital firm called Quidnet, which only invests in New Zealand. Uh, I recently become an investor and a venture partner working with him. So I'm going to be working with New Zealand with startups, trying to help them, help him find pe people to invest in and help make those investments successful. Right. So if I'm going to, I've sort of started a relationship with New Zealand through Mark, who is a Edmund Hillary scholar and and, and fellow, fellow, Edmund Hillary fellow, and recently moved to Auckland. So, so that's kind of the background. I'm you know, happy to be here for the first time. Probably be here again at some point. Um, so that's um, that's just kind of a preamble why I just came. So I should have you know, here on the first slide. So, I then went and found this this website. Pepeha, I don't know. So anyone go there and you can like, type things in and say. Yeah, I put it at the bottom. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Um, and I'm not going to try and say the uh, Maori pronunciation of this, so I'll let you that can read it. But so it's greetings all. Um, to Corral de Tierra, Monterey, California is the mountain. That's that's the house I live in. That's the mountain I can see out of my office window. I'm a lot closer to it. It's called Corral de Tierra, which means the wall of rock in Spanish. And it is literally, it's a natural formation. It's it's um, This is Steinbeck country. This is uh, Steinbeck wrote some books based there. So that's it. Now, I don't really have a river, so I cheated. Um, the Ao Ao Channel, which means take a bath here, it's nice, uh, is eight miles wide and 100 feet deep, and it's between Maui and Blanai. Well, that's a picture part of it. It's basically whale soup. It has a few thousand uh, whales in it right now. Um, you just watch the ocean for a bit, and you'll see one spouting or jumping out. It takes about 30 seconds at this time of year to see a whale. Um, Lived there for about six years, part time. Um, and this is this gets a little bit emotional, but Lahaina is right there. I always choke up. So Lahaina burnt less. Yeah, it was last August. Last, yeah, last August. The entire town. Is gone. Uh, friends of mine have the the the, the clothes they stood up in. Um, so we sold that house towards the end of last year to somebody who lost their house in the thing. So I no longer have a house there, but it's a very special place for me. Okay. Um, and I'm from Weymouth, UK, which is one of the original seaside resorts back in the. 1800s, 1700s, one of the places where that idea was invented in England. My parents met there. My parents moved back there when they retired. 
I visit them several times a year and it's where my first memories are. So that's my, my location. So, okay. And uh, Cockcroft's my family. My name's Adrian. Oh, thank you. And that's it for this show. Okay. All right. Thank you. And I will have to learn to say this, I guess, but uh, I wasn't going to try it this time. Okay. Thank you. All right. Although switching a lot, it's not really a river, but whatever. Okay. So this is the, the abstract I wrote. This is what um, the, the title ended up being after going back and forth a few times. Um, and I'll get to why I thought this was interesting, but I wanted to figure out how LLM training works. Um, I also, if you're not interested in this, I took a lot of nice pictures on the way here. So there'll be pictures of, you know, I was in Tahiti for 10 days. So there's pictures taken by the author. And this was flying into Bora Bora. Um, some of the pictures were taken about there because there's some nice fish there. Um, that was out of the window of the plane, particularly, particularly cute place. Um, so this is the overview. I'm going to talk about why do I care about this? Why will it matter to more people? And then trying to explain how training, fine tuning and inference work. Goes. How do they structure it? What does the hardware software stack looks like? How it behaves, how it's changing over time? And how do we observe it? What does the ability look like? And I should finish fairly early for discussions. So this is this is a very curious fish. It, I mean, I had holding my iPhone underwater, and if, if they do work underwater, you just have to rinse out the connectors for quite a long time afterwards. Um, this got this is a very curious. Um, this is a tail sergeant fish. It came out. It was looking at me, and I got a super super high resolution picture of it. Um, so this just really comes from curiosity. I'm not a practitioner anymore. I don't have a team, but. I do have this long history as a performance specialist. Um, I published this book back in the 90s. Some of you may vaguely remember it. I have a dusty copy somewhere on your bookshelves that you never look at anymore because it's all obsolete. Um, I'm not a hands-on user of LLM, so this is mostly me digging through the references, reading some code, reading some papers, trying to understand how all this stuff works. Uh, I was also the chief architect for Netflix and the transition to AWS and started the open source program that Netflix put out lots of code that was very influential, and lots of talks there. Um, but one of the things we had there was this really effic efficient goal. Like every dollar that, uh, that Netflix gave to AWS could be used to subsidize Amazon Prime, right? So that was the way we thought about it. So we wanted to be the least profitable customer they had. And they're one of the largest and I think one of the most efficient cloud installations that I've still seen. I've seen a lot of people I've seen a lot of cloud installations. I still don't think anyone has got close to the to the efficiency. Like if you ran Netflix the way you ran, when most people run in the cloud, their their bill will be two or three times bigger. It's it's not just a few percent. It's incredibly efficient the way everything was run. Uh, no cycle left unused kind of thing. Um, okay. So why will this matter to everyone else? Well, it turns out training and operating these LLM based workflows is slow and expensive. And what we're seeing now is a bunch of researchy applications. People are figuring things out. They think, okay, let's get into production. Let's put it in our call center. So people call in and they're chatting to this chat bot that we built, that kind of thing. And then they're discovering, well, this costs more than the people we used to pay. So that's not good. Um, and there's a, there's a table here. And the, the essential point in the table is that the cost of using OpenAI's chat GPT is 25 times higher than a do-it-yourself one. Right. Chat, open AI, ChatGPT is extremely good. Everyone I talked to, all the developers, yes, it is way better than everything else. But it's slow, it's expensive, and it goes down some of the time. So if you're trying to build a, an application that needs to be up and not, needs to not bankrupt you when you're trying to just, when, when inference turns up, when people start using it, there's a big incentive to, okay, can I make something that is almost as good as ChatGPT, but 20 times cheaper that is running on my infrastructure and I'm in control of whether it's up or down, right? So as we move to production, this is why I think this is going to become important. A big incentive. And then what are you going to run that on? You're going to run it on these nice new machines like the AWS uh, P5DN instance, or P5 instance, which is about $100 an hour. Now, it's 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 overpriced because they're in such short supply that AWS jacked up the price just to kind of try and control supply and demand. And if you buy, if you want 10,000 of these at once, you're definitely not paying $100 an hour. But this is a pretty monstrous machine. It's got 
192 vCPUs, 2 terabytes of RAM, 8 GPU, 8 of the H100 GPUs in it, 3,200 gigabits of bandwidth. Hang on a minute. What? What? 3.2 terabits of bandwidth? This is like why I did this talk. Is that what? Why do you need 3.2 terabits of bandwidth into a single machine that's sitting in the cloud? What are you doing with 3.2 terabits? What? Then they wouldn't have put it on if there wasn't a reason for it. Then there's some, yeah, whatever, 30, 30 terabytes of SSDs. Um, all right. So brain, some kind of brain coral. Um, so how do how are these things used? So the, these foundation models like ChatGPT, like uh, Lambda Lambda Two, which are trained on tens of thousands of machines for months. That's the normal workload, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And if they can get twenty thousand or fifty thousand machines, and they can run it, for, you know, they they can. But they're turning these things around in several months. I've got lots of links to references in in, in at the bottom. Um, so. This is where not many people are doing that. This is a huge bill thing, right? So OpenAI are doing it, Facebook are doing it, a few other people are doing it, yeah, Anthropic, whatever, people like that. And then what people are actually doing is they're building either small versions of those models that use hundreds of CPUs for several days, and that's much more plausible to run. That's why you can do it for much less. Um, but that's where the inter that's where the experimentation is. That's where people are iterating. They're trying stuff. They're tinkering with it because if every few days you get a new version, you can try it out. Okay, the the, the new Chat GPT version five, whatever, is months away. Right? There's these sort of things are happening on a, on a much longer scale. And then the other thing you're doing is taking the existing model, and and the old style sort of AI that we've been sort of learned over the last few years is you know you point at pictures of cats, pictures of dogs, and say is this a cat or a dog? Right? You train and then you do inference. With these new models, there's another step where you do pre-training or fine-tuning. So you take the existing model, which generally knows about the structure of questions and answers and has general knowledge about the world, and you train it some additional information. Uh, my mental model of this is like it's a high school intern. That they generally know how to study things. They don't know how to do a task. You get, you get the intern into your business, and you train them to do a task, and they can, you know, in some sloppy way, do that task. Right. That's kind of my mental model for what this looks like. But each new version over time is getting better. So that it turns through a high school intern to a college intern. And eventually, in some domains, you've got a senior engineer that actually remembers the syntax of that language better than you do or how to use that library. Or there, there are some places where the co-pilot assistants are like having just a really experienced engineer on the shoulder reminding you how to do things. So, But very particular. In certain places where you hit the sweet spot, it's good. Other places, not so good. So that's what we're trying to do. You're trying to build that expert who is, knows more about it than you do or than the user does. So, But those, those again, you're using hundreds of GPUs for tens of hours to do that fine training work. Right? So this is sort of trying to, I'm trying to get the mental models for the orders of magnitude for what this looks like. That's sort of my goal here. And then there's a bunch of things like retrieval augmented generation where you want to refer to an actual, you have a, a genuine answer. You have an FAQ. So you want to sort of encode all your answers, encode all the questions, and you're, you're trying to use the AI to match. Did somebody ask one of the questions that, where you know the answer? So you start going to sort of verifiable results, links to papers or FAQ answers, and you know, links to your Wikipedia page or whatever, um, rather than a hallucination, right? So it's not making it up. It's trying to figure out which answer it should be. Um, and there's a lot of work going on in inference, but the inference workloads are much more horizontally scaled. You, you get the cut down model, you squeeze it into a machine, you ask it these questions. It's not really a huge, you, know, you don't need 3.2 terabits of network bandwidth to do inference, as far as I can tell. So this, so I'm not really looking into that anymore. Um, and it's a really, we've been at flight, swimming over this. What's that thing? It turns out those are the lips of a giant clam. Kind of looks cool. Um, so I've got a couple of examples. This paper is a really nice one. It's easy to follow. It goes step by step through everything that people are. This is kind of the classic application. I want to produce an expert in climate. I'm going to teach this Jeep, this 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 thing. Everything from all of the science papers. Everything. It's just going to be. You go and have chats to it, and it gives you answers that are as if you're talking to a climate scientist that's read all the literature across the domains. 
So it's really nice, and they translate it into multiple languages. So this is kind of a cool thing. Erasmus.ai is a Dutch company, a pretty cool company. Um, the paper is really, really good read. So it's sort of it's it's just a nice way it steps through everything. And this is one where you can see um, they were trying to uh, the the from scratch thing. They tried using the um, the, the Llama seventy billion thing, and they tweaked it a bit. But in the end, they basically went and built their own model from scratch. So the FSC is the from scratch climate model. Um, it's got what, 300 billion tokens or something in it. Um, it took 14,000 GPU hours. They actually used uh, 20 nodes, um, H100, 8 per node. So it's 160 GPUs, took four days. That's four day run. So this is kind of, they iterated a bit. They tried it out and compared it and were tuning that thing. So that's this is kind of a, a sweet spot for this is what a lot of people are trying to do, right? This is a, this is a it's actually a friend of mine that um, used to work at Amazon, um, and and a bunch of really this is really bleeding edge stuff. Um, mixtures of experts instead of having one model you train to do everything, they have a bunch of small models. It's almost like microservices. You have a model that's specialized to do one thing, and you're assembling experts in in a chain of reasoning with states in between. Uh, and what they're doing, this is for DevOps monitoring. Like you have all, all your outage data, your, your your logs, your monitoring data. You feed it all the flip, and they have a model which will try and quickly tell you what's wrong. And they assemble all the information so that it, you can reduce your mean time to to recover for a, for an operation. It's it's plausibly doing doing okay. But what they've got is using these mechanisms. They've got better results than Chat GPT four. They're not trying to get almost as good as it. They've actually exceeded the performance of ChatGPT by building a series of experts that collaborate to produce the result, right? And the, each expert, because you've got much better domain control, you're much you're more able to sort of constrain what it's doing. And there's another one of these um, that's in the coding space called Alpha Codium. Um, I just put the link at the bottom. But so this seems to be the trend. We're building, we're decomposing the problem into chunks, and we're solving those chunks. So each of those chunks is tunable by a different team individually. All right, nice fire coral, some goat fish. Um, so what does these hardware configurations look like? The older ones, um, sort of A100 architecture, this is sort of what the AWS model looked like. You have your CPU, which is the thing that's got the networking connected to it, a PCI switch, the GPUs on the switch, and then there's a, a switch fabric that's connecting the GPUs on the machine together. All right, so the GPUs are connected together in the switch fabric, but then they go across PCI bus to get to the network and share that with the CPUs. Right. That's kind of the traditional architecture for an attached processor. The current um, H100 architecture, the GPUs are effectively driving the network much more directly. The, the CPU is out of the way, and there's sort of a diagram here showing. But what we've got is eight 400 gigabit networks, per, so there's one per GPU. So the reason you have 3.2 terabits is because you have eight GPUs, and each GPU is driving 400 gigabits um, and it's the way we'll look later at how those are connected together what's it going to look like next i think this is interesting um some of this the previous talk about the super node this is nvidia's super node um the grace hopper super chip this is a monster um this is the thing i like okay this says 900 gigabytes per second 900 gigabytes right it turns out the GPU is now the center of this thing. The CPU is the attached processor hanging off on the side. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, you need something to run Linux occasionally. But really, the GPU is connected to high bandwidth memory, and it's connected to the network, and you have 256 GPUs on a coherent memory network. All right, that's about 50 terabytes of HBM in a single coherent domain with 256 GPUs. If your head isn't exploding, then you don't know what the previous machines look like. This is a cool machine. I don't know how you program it to do normal things, but for AI training, this is what they want. Uh, huh? How much do they cost? Um, how much do they cost? You, you, somebody bought one. There's, there's a bunch of people that have bought one. Um, the, how much? Yes. There are a number of supercomputer centers around the world that have bought 20,000 of these or 10,000 of these or something like that. The first ones are starting to roll out. And um, was I nice talking to you? Yeah, you, you, you've got one. When, 
you know, we we don't have to say how much it costs, but yeah, there are people in the room that have that have written, seen this spec and said, yes, I want one, um, or a pile of them. So I think this is cool. So this is the node. This is 256 of them, dot, 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 dot. And this is one domain. And then you have lots of InfiniBand connecting lots of those together to make you your bigger thing. So the, the node you're connecting on the InfiniBand is now 50 terabytes of graphics memory, of, of GPU memory, um, 256 terabytes of, of main memory, and you know, all this monstrous stuff. Anyway. So I, I think I think those are cool. I've been talking about architectures like this and thinking about how to program them for uh, quite a few years, bef and so I'm just happy to see this hardware finally turn up. As a, there's a talk, there's a, a, a story I wrote sort of about what I thought was happening in supercomputing a year or so ago. I call these petalith architectures, sort of petabyte scale mod petabytes of memory monoliths, and sort of super node petalith that's sort of just similar kind of thing. Okay. So how do you actually schedule work on this system? So the way that the AI training works is you take your data and you're actually pumping the data from one GPU to the next on a pipeline they call a rail, and the, all the communications happen in that rail. So each GPU only needs to talk to the GPU behind it in the rail. There's no other cross-communication. Um, and that's sort of coming down top to bottom on this. Those are, these, these devices are in the rail. And they pass the data through one way, and then they pass the data back through the other way. And then there's this cross-aggregation where you're sort of accumulating and generating averages and things like that. And then after it's gone through completely, um, there's a parameter block. That, that black line is the one time through, stop, okay, now you've got everything. You have to kind of synchronize. It's a barrier synchronization. Then you do it again. So the workload, there's a, this extra stuff going on here is basically the complexity here is to try and get a small th th these pipeline bubbles to go down. The gray parts here are where you're waiting for data, right? The bubbles in the pipeline, the work. So if you look at the activity of the system, it's pretty busy. And because the overhead of just splitting the work up and spreading it around. And as you get bigger and bigger, these diagrams get bigger and more complicated. But anyway, um, the Megatron paper is like the paper that describes all this stuff. And that's kind of the starting point for it. You know, I'm sure many of you have read it already, but uh, Nemo Megatron is the and basically the NVIDIA open source package that you use to create and run these things. And that's everything sort of follows down underneath that big pile of code. All right, so what does the networking software stack look like? Um, that that algorithm um, is P... Pipeline tensor and data parallelism is sort of three types of parallelism all jammed together, PTDP. So that's written using PyTorch. Um, Torch.distributed is the package if you want to just read the... I just started reading the code and deep, getting deeper into it. it. It starts off in Python. It rapidly turns into CUDA, which is basically a C++, but really it's C. I've opened, I learned C 40-something years ago, so that was easy. Then you get down to NCCL, the, the N NVIDIA communication libraries, and then there are plugins for different architectures under that. And the architecture, the, the interesting one that I hadn't seen before I started digging into this is the Sharp architecture. Um, so this came out a little while ago uh, from Mellanox in the InfiniBand switch. Inside the switch, as you're communing data, communicating data between the machines, what you're trying to do is take the data that's in every GPU average it all together and give it back to the GPU so they can carry on, right? That So you have to somewhere do that averaging. What Sharp does, it does the averaging in the switch. So basically, everyone sends their data to the switch, and what you get back is the average of everyone's data. So we're hearing a little bit about computing in memory in the previous talk. This is computing in the switch. So then that's in the InfiniBand switch, but it's also now happening in the NVIDIA NV switch. And there's 400 gigaflops per switch chip. The switch chip, I think, has more transistors than the H100. It's, it's this thing that they're connecting all of these uh, machines together with. So now we've got compute happening in the network. So you think about that, well, how, you know, if you think about that from a security point of view, it becomes clear that this entire network, this entire training network is running as a single, unprotected, no security, the domain, right? You have to build a firewall around it from a security point of view. Right. 
in the interior of it has no encryption, no authentication, nothing. It's like, I need to get my data to that GPU and I don't care. Right. So there's no protection boundaries inside the system. You have so from a, from an enterprise computing point of view that you have to kind of think about this huge cluster of machines as a, as a target to protect. Anyway, I think that's, um, there's some links to the sharp papers and things like that, but I think that's a pretty, pretty cool system. And you can see that they tend to deploy this code as sort of Kubernetes containers, but there's a bunch of bypasses, so it's not really subject to the normal way you'd run Kubernetes. It's sort of use that deployment model, but then it kind of goes straight to the hardware. All right. This is a cool little thing. They get little bits of coral and hang them on bits of string, so they grow with the coral garden. So there's a bunch of curating coral gardens I, I was swimming around in. Um, it reminded me of the network topology. So how do you connect these things together? Um, the conventional plus that you just connect everything together. It turns out that's very inefficient. Um, so a lot of people have been doing this sort of rail based networking, but then with a the spine, but it turns out the spine is a waste of time. So this is paper saying, yeah, I don't need the spine. We're just going to have the rails with the GPUs are all connected together across the switches. There is a dedicated bit. You are only talking from one GPU to another. There's no other traffic. So you have 100% capacity on this single pipe, and there's no conflicting traffic, and that's the only thing you're going to do on that. You send data that way, uh, the, uh, aggreg the, the return data comes back, and you do that as a single operation, and you just keep doing that across your whole array of systems. And any other data you want to do, you'll do indirect sort of copying through the system. Um, or maybe there's sort of an ethernet somewhere for sort of control planning. So interesting papers there. Um, this is where I think some of the generic HPC architectures, like you look at Frontier or something like that, its architecture is designed for running general purpose HPC workloads with all kinds of interconnection issues. What we've got here is a very dedicated architecture. So if you've got a system set up like this, it's probably not going to run most HPC workloads very well. But conversely, most, you know, Dragonfly kind of architectures, whatever, are unlikely to run AI training very effectively. They're going to be band they're going to be bottlenecked on, on their network architecture, I think, because they're not designed, they're not laid out with this rail concept in mind. So I think what we've got here is in very large, extremely single purpose layouts. And I'm not sure, I mean, you could obviously wire it up differently, but um, this is um, an area where I think sometimes if we look, there was a paper that was discussed yesterday, I think, that they were running some AI training using actually a version of Megatron on the Frontier machine using a few of the GPUs. It's probably not that cost effective to do that. If you just fired up some some of these in, you know, in DGX Cloud and NVIDIA and ran that workload there, you'd probably get a faster, cheaper result just because the network and the way it's optimized is set up better. But I don't know. That's a point of discussion. I'm just throwing that out there. It's a bit, a bit controversial, maybe. Um, AWS has a different te topology internally, and they've had this thing called the FA for a while, which is a non-blocking multipath connectivity. For general HPC workloads, I think this is interesting. They basically launch data on all the paths in parallel, so they get, very, uh, they get a, a very low variance on the traffic. So it takes an amount of time to send, say, a megabyte somewhere, but because it's scatter gather with very fast retry using this this RD, uh, SRD protocol, um, it's it's an it's an interesting thing. You don't get any head of lane blocking problems ahead of um, yeah. There. This uses libfabric. It's over Ethernet. I think it's probably not optimal for running these rail based GPU architectures. And and I think AWS and NVIDIA together, AWS is now basically adopting the NVIDIA architecture internally. They're standing up DGX Cloud effectively within AWS, and they're jointly collaborating on the next generation uh, CBA, uh, Project CBA, which is 16384 of those GX200. So that's, I think, 512 nodes times the 256. I think I got that right. Um, which is around an exaflop. When they run the benchmark, if they run HPC on that and publish it, and NVIDIA has generally published a, a top 500 result on its internal systems. They're currently running like eight or ninth in the top 500. This is probably an exa exaflop, maybe more than an exaflop around that level. And some of the clusters that are being sold are like 20,000 or, or even bigger. So there's definitely, you know, top of the, of the top 500 list stuff happening just to run this stuff. 
Um, that's a picture. I'm not sure if that's the entire cluster, but that's a relatively small number of racks to be an exathlon, I think. All right. Um, what I really care about as a performance tuning person is the sort of behaviors and the observability. And what does this system look like when it's doing something? Uh, as this is a nice quote I found one of those papers. So at scale, it's communication intensive. While training on 3,000 GPUs with a trillion parameter model, you've got 892 gigabytes per second of pipeline parallel communication and 13 terabytes for data parallel communication. So yeah, it's pretty network intensive. So how are you going to figure that out? Uh, Datadog has some monitoring, the standard enterprise monitoring tool. Most enterprises, or many of them have Datadog. They monitor GPUs now, as you'd expect, so that you can go and see your GPUs, make sure they're doing okay. So the generic uh, performance monitoring tools are starting to just as build this in as a new workload. I think that's a trend. Um, the, one of the other things you need to understand is the detailed topology of the thing you're looking at and the HW lock, or whatever it's called, um, topology database, which is part of MPI, um, just has this XML file which describes everything about your hardware, all the NUMA, how it's connected, all the parts. It's sort of a complete hardware topology. So if you're ever wondering what the architecture of a machine is, go find it in this database and you can see in excruciating detail how everything is. So this is going to be one of the really key inputs to understanding an architecture and optimizing for it. Once you've figured that out, there's you just go to you know, somewhere in, in Linux, there'll be a number that tells you how many packets and whatever. So there's data in there at the raw level that people can summarize. So that's kind of the low level stuff, particularly for training. But if you look at inference, which is where a lot more of the sort of novelty is coming from, um, there's a really nice uh, training video um, by Bernice Herman that I found. She's at Y Labs, and this is sort of just what their toolkit does. So in terms of inference monitoring, you want to know. You're tracking the prompts, the responses. Is everything working? The sentiment, is it doing what it said it was going to do? Or is it is it doing unintended things? Is it like there's topics I don't want it to talk about? Is it, can you put, are people trying to do that? Are people trying to jailbreak into it? So there's all this kind of meta monitoring for, for an inference system that you'll need to set up to make sure everything is behaving itself and what is the policies and things. So this is kind of a new breed of monitoring that is coming along um, that people are starting to play around with. Okay, so that's pretty much what I had. So the little, it's a different Sergeant Fish is going to swim away now. Um, got some discussion uh, points, and you can contact me at orionx.net um, or, or Mastodon. I, I abandoned Twitter about a year ago. Um, but all of the stuff, when I was researching this, I put it on on a mirror. Um, and so these notes, it's an open mirror board. If you want to kind of rummage around, find the links, but if you want to contribute to it because I got something wrong or you want to add some notes or something, just hit me up and I'll share share you right permission, okay? So then if you want to go visit this mirror, hopefully that QR code works or you can type it in. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.